Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing bradykinin-induced vasodilatation. Okay, so so far what we've seen is uh, we've seen that bradykinin uh, doused on an endothelial cell is going to cause calcium waves which is going to uh, cause the production of these calcium cam-modulin complexes. We've then had a discussion of the ENOS enzyme or the NOS free enzyme and how it is localized at the, um, at the plasma membrane either via uh, palmitolation and myristolation or by uh, being bound to the intracellular aspect of this B2 receptor. Okay, what we now want to see is how is calcium calmodulin complexes going to activate this ENOS to produce nitric oxide. Okay, so what's going to happen basically is these calcium calmodulin complexes are going to come and bind to this linker region here between the reductase domain and the oxygenase domain. So here comes our calcium calmodulin complex. Okay, and basically, calmodulin, it's not necessary that it's the calcium, but the calmodulin seems to act as the switch. It turns this enzyme on. The enzyme does not function until the calcium calmodulin has bound there. And what did I mean by it's not the calcium? Well, when you look at the other nitric oxide synthase enzymes, specifically when you look at INOS, INOS is an enzyme that is constitutive, oh, sorry, that is always active. Once you produce INOS, there's no way to turn it off unless you actually destroy it. And the reason is that INOS always has calmodulin bound to this linker region between the oxygenase and reductase domain. But the cal calmodulin doesn't have to have calcium bound to it for the INOS to be turned on. All it needs is that calmodulin bound to it. A similar thing is believed to hold true for this ENOS, that it just needs the calmodulin bound to it. However, calmodulin will only bind to ENOS when it's in the form of calcium calmodulin complexes, i.e. apocalmodulin will not bind to ENOS, whereas it will bind to INOS. So that's the difference between the two. Okay, so when the calcium calmodulin complexes are formed, they're going to bind to this linker region between the oxygenase and the reductase domains of uh, the ENOS protein. That's going to turn these ENOS proteins on, and they're now going to start synthesizing nitric oxide. In addition, I just want to um, say this, that when you, uh, when you bind calcium calmodulin complexes to ENOS, what appears to happen is that ENOS breaks off the B2 receptor, i.e. if you apply bradykinin to B2 receptors and it causes the calcium waves, and then the calcium calmodulin complexes, what will happen is ENOS will break off, so they no longer attach. So this, this bond here will be broken when the calcium calmodulin comes and binds. So potentially that suggests that the place where Enos bi well, sorry, the place where B2 binds to ENOS is this linker. It, potentially, it's the same site as the calcium calmodulin complex. In addition, another bit of evidence for that is that if you use the calcium ionophore called um, A23187, uh, okay, A23187, A23187, which also has another name. Its other name is calcimycin. So this is actually used as an antibiotic and also I think as an antifungi. Uh, it's a pretty severe drug to have to give someone, but it is a powerful uh, killer. Um, basically, what this drug does is it's a calcium ionophore. So what it does is it binds to calcium ions. So let's say this is a calcium ion. Let's say this is the A23187 drug here or calcimycin. So this is calcimycin or A23187 in pink. What it's going to do is it's going to bind to calcium and it can then cross the cell membrane and when it gets to the intracellular compartment it can then release calcium. So it can move into the intracellular compartment and release calcium. So this is a calcium ionophore basically. Okay, so let me just list that here. So calcium ionophore. So if you apply this drug to endothelial cells, if you apply calcimycin to endothelial cells, then it will deliver calcium from the extracellular space into the cytoplasm. 
the calcium will bind to calmodulin, producing calcium calmodulin complexes, and this will also cause enos to dissociate from B2. So that's why we believe that it's the calcium calmodulin complexes which break the enos off from the B2 receptor, rather than the B2 receptor becoming activated on its own. Okay, right, so the enos breaks off from the B2 receptor, and it's also going to start functioning, basically. So it's going to start producing nitric oxide, basically. So let me remind you of the reaction that has to happen in order for us to produce nitric oxide. So basically, the starting product for all of the um, nitric oxide synthesis is L-arginine. So let me remind you of the structure of L-arginine. Um, in fact, maybe I should get another piece of paper to do this. I'll turn over because um, we're going to need a lot of space for this. So, the structure of L-arginine then. Here is the basic amino acid structure here. Okay, so the amino terminus up there, the carboxylic acid group down here, the hydrogen off the alpha carbon, uh, the methylene groups. You have three methylene groups in the R group of arginine. One two, three, okay. Then you have a nitrogen off next, so you have a nitrogen here with a hydrogen off it. Then you have a carbon with an amino group coming off up here, and then a double bond to a nitrogen down here and a hydrogen off that. Now this nitrogen that has the double bond, that is known as the guanadino nitrogen. So this is the guanadino nitrogen. And this guanidino nitrogen, this guanidino nitrogen is going to end up being the nitrogen that's going to be used in uh, nitric oxide. Okay, so what is going to happen? L-arginine, which is this amino acid we've got here, is going to come in and bind to our nitric oxide synthase. So let me show you where it binds. It binds just next to this heme group here. So it's going to bind somewhere around there, basically. Let me colour in this site. This orange site is where L-arginine is going to bind, basically, there. Okay, and I want to stress there will also be a calcium calmodulin complex here as well. So let me just draw that in. Here's the calcium calmodulin complex bound there. Okay, so L-arginine is going to come in. It's going to bind to the enzyme. Now what else is going to come in? We're also going to bring in an oxygen molecule. So in comes an oxygen molecule, okay? Now, where's the oxygen molecule going to bind to on the nitric oxide synthase? Well, it's going to bind to the iron that is at it, the centre of the heme prosthetic group. So don't fear heme prosthetic groups. Let me just talk a little bit about heme prosthetic groups. They are a structure which has a ring of uh, atoms known as a porphyrin ring. So they have a porphyrin ring here, okay? And at the centre of the porphyrin ring, they coordinate a ferrous cation, which just means an iron cation with a positive charge and a divalent positive charge. So iron cations can exist in more than one state. So you can have iron with a double positive charge, which is known as a ferrous cation. So this is a ferrous cation. Cation just means positively charged ion. Uh, this is also often denoted as Fe2, potentially, with Roman numerals, and also as Fe and then brackets 2, like so. So these are all ways of denoting the ferrous cation. Okay. Um, in addition to it being able to exist in the ferrous cation state, it can also exist in the ferric cation state, which is where it has a three positive charges, like so, Fe3+, plus, or Fe Roman numeral 3, like that. So this is what's known as a ferric cation. Now, ferric cations are not used at the centre of heme prosthetic groups. Okay, so you have this ring known as the porphyrin ring with an iron cation, which is in the ferrous cation state at the centre, and it's coordinated by four coordinate bonds, two of which are covalent, and uh, these other ones are just electrostatic. Okay, now, the porphyrin ring is a very planar structure. It actually will sit in a plane. So, the iron cation has two more bonds that it can potentially support. It can support a bond coming down from below, and also a bond coming up from, sorry, coming down from above, and also a bond coming up from below. 
so it can support two more coordinate bonds. Now, one of those extra coordinate bonds will be used up when we attached the uh, heme group to our protein. So, a, an amino acid residue, generally histidine, will have bound with the ferrous cation at the centre of our porphyrin ring, uh, from below, let's say, and that leaves one final sixth coordinate bond that is free. The oxygen molecule is going to come in and have that final sixth coordinate bond with the ferrous cation at the centre of this heme group. Okay, so that's where the oxygen is going to come and bind. Finally, you're also going to bring in a molecule of reduced NADP, okay, which brings in two protons and two electrons, okay? So this basically brings in two protons plus two electrons. The electrons are the important things because protons are free in the cytoplasm of the cell. We can get those from the cytoplasm. Electrons are rare things. So what's now going to happen, basically, is that the NADP is going to come and bind here. The oxygen will bind here. The L-arginine will bind here. These are the four constituents. The NADP will give up its two electrons, which will be passed to the flavin adenine dinucleotide, which is bound here, which will then pass them on to the flavin mononucleotide, which is bound here, which will then pass them on to the heme group, the ferrous cation at the center of the heme group, which will then pass them on to the oxygen. Okay, so what's going to happen basically is that we are going to reduce this oxygen molecule. We're going to give it two electrons. And effectively, what we're going to do is we're going to break this double bond between these two oxygens. We will give one of these oxygen atoms the two electrons, okay? And now it's got all the electrons it could want, because remember, oxygen has six outer shell electrons. It wants to gain two more, or we've just given it two more. So what it will then do is it will associate with these two protons, which may or may not be the same protons that the NADP actually provided, um, or the reduced NADP provided. Probably not, okay? It will just pick up protons from the cytoplasm, and it will form a water molecule. So you've effectively taken two hydrogen atoms bound them to an or oxygen atom. Okay, now what are we going to do with this other oxygen atom here? Well, basically what we're going to do is we're going to stick it in the middle of this bond here. So we're going to break this bond between the guanidino nitrogen and the hydrogen. What we're then going to do is put in our oxygen atom in the middle, form a single bond between the nitrogen and the oxygen, and then another single bond between the oxygen and the nitrogen. So let me show you the structure we're going to get. Okay, so here's the amino acid structure drawn again. So the amino group up here. Okay, the hydrogen off the alpha carbon. The carboxylic acid group down here. Okay, and then these three methylene groups here like so. So none of this has changed. This is all still the same from L-arginine. Okay. And then you have this nitrogen next up here. Then a carbon with an amino group off up here. And then double bonded to this guanidino nitrogen. And then with a hydroxyl group sticking off like that. Okay. So that's what you've overall produced now. This molecule here and water. Now what is the name for this molecule? Well, it's known as NG for guanidino nitrogen, and then it's called hydroxy, and then L-arginine, okay? So it's pretty much exactly the same as our original L-arginine, except that it's got a hydroxyl group off the, L, off the guanidino nitrogen. So that name makes uh, good sense. Okay, right. So now that's our intermediate product. What do we do next? Well, what we do is we bring in another oxygen molecule. So another oxygen molecule comes and binds to the ferrous cation of the heme group. And then we bring in another molecule of reduced NADP. However, this time it does not need to provide two electrons. Instead, it will only provide one electron and one proton. Okay, so this electron will again be passed from the reduced NADP to the flavin adenine dinucleotide, to the flavin mononucleotide, and then onto uh, the heme, which will pass it to the oxygen. 
Okay, right. Uh, so um, you're going to again break apart this uh, bond here, basically. Um, okay, and um, then um, what you're going to do, so let me draw out the structure of what you're going to get and then I'll describe where everything's going because this is a more difficult reaction to understand this next one. So the molecule that you get out of this is a molecule known as L-citrulline. So here's the amino acid structure again, so the alpha carbon here with the carboxylic acid group down here, okay, the hydrogen coming off here, and then this these three methylene groups again, okay, and the nitrogen coming off next, here, with its hydrogen coming off here, and then a carbon with an amino group up here, and then double bonded to an oxygen. This is L-citrulline, okay? Right, so this is the product. This is what we're going to get out of this. So, what we basically do is we cleave this double bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. We also cleave this bond between the oxygen and the oxygen. Okay, we then take one of these oxygen atoms and we bind it to this carbon atom to create L-citrulline. Okay, what we also do is we cleave off this bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen and then we forge a new bond between this nitrogen and this oxygen to create nitric oxide. Now, you will notice that the oxygen is perfectly happy with this. It's broken one bond and forged a new one with the nitrogen. The nitrogen is not perfectly happy. It's broken two bonds and has forged only a single new one. Okay, so it still has an unpaired electron, which makes nitric oxide a free radical, a very um, reactive molecule. Okay, right, so nitric oxide has been produced. We've then got this electron and this hydrogen here, which is effectively a hydrogen atom. And we've also got a hydrogen atom from here, which will be bound to that final oxygen atom to create us water. So that overall is what happens in this next reaction. So you get L-citrulline, you get nitric oxide, and you get water. So that's overall how the enos enzyme, once activated, is going to turn the substrate L-arginine into L-citrulline and in the process produce nitric oxide.